this panel is uh, really exciting to me because I was lucky enough to see the, the panel is about the new building that Unusual Rigging have built in Northampton. Um, the building is a really exciting new building because A, it's beautiful by any measure, you know, even to just look at. But I think what Tom will tell you is that actually the beauty is inside because the driving goal of the building has to be what we will glibly call eco, but it's much more than that because Tom's passion, I guess is the word, is the full circularity of everything. So the ambition is when you get done with this building, which will happen at some point in the future, you can take it all apart and it will all turn into something else or recycle and not become waste in a landfill. Um, and that's, it's amazing on many levels, but it's amazing because it's a long-term ambition when so much of what we do on these shows that we do is very short-term ambition. So hopefully we will all learn something about how we should all do this. So I'm going to introduce Tom, and then I'm just going to sit and listen, and he can introduce the rest of the team. Tom is the what is, chair, what are you now called? Managing what? director. Managing director um, of uh, Unusual Rigging, who are the leading supplier of if you want to get something in a strange place that nobody can get it there, Olympic ceremonies, rock shows, anything else, unusual are the people. Um, yeah, Tom, introduce the team, and then we'll take it from there. Hello, and good morning, good afternoon, in fact. Um, so, either side of me, I have uh, Johnny, Johnny Plant, who is the architect, the lead architect for the, uh, for the design of our new HQ. And I have Borja from KLH, which is a sustainability consultancy that we, we worked very closely with from the get-go. Closer. Project, Tom. Project. Oh, yes. Can Tom was an actor once. I was. I'll just say that. as a. It was a long time ago, so I've forgotten about Yes, and, and Borgia, who is uh, with KLH, which are the sustainability consultancy team that we used. Uh, to, and the reason that we wanted to have a very specific and long-term engaged relationship with KLH in the program was because of the importance of doing very, really assessing the minutiae detail about the build, the materials that we were going with and everything else and the process of uh, the operational process. How Can I just throw a question levels? in before you go further, Tom, quickly? Yeah. So I guess my starting question is, why, why do this? What is your rationale, yeah. route into it, any of those things? Well, I mean, at a personal level and then at a company level, Unusual have been really passionate about the idea of sustainability and specifically the concept of a circular economy as a holistic overview, a way of applying systems thinking to economic models and recognizing the importance, especially at this stage, with every hour that ticks by, that we need to design an economy that is regenerative and restorative by design as opposed to the current extractive, depletive and polluting economy that globally is, is in existence. So whilst our scope of influence is relatively um, modest, tiny, in fact, um, it didn't feel that that was a reason not to try and apply these principles to the extent that we could. And actually the journey that we went on was an interesting one because we learned about what obstacles were in the way of us being able to fulfill absolute full circularity. I mean, I think on balance, we achieved an, a phenomenal job. And in many instances, as, as we'll talk about, you know, this building is actually a world first in terms of the choices that we made, the materiality, uh, some of the, um, what would we call it? Trial, the trial period, the pilot, pilot the pilot phase for some of the, um, for the, some of the materials, which we couldn't use in the end. But we really feel passionate about it as a, as a group of stakeholders. And we feel that despite the fact that your wonderful selves are here, we really want hundreds more people to hear about this and understand how it was feasible what the opportunities are at the moment currently on the ground, what are the challenges, both legislative challenges as well as material option challenges, and uh, what we collectively can do through continued conversation to ensure that we accelerate this transition to a fully circular economy. And the beauty of the, uh, like from an unusual point of view, the beauty of theatre is that we're an industry of storytellers. And we might live on a finite planet, but we have infinite creativity. So who better as a group of stakeholders to really explore this concept 
of circularity and thinking about how we contribute towards this transition to a restorative economic model. I think it's also interesting because it, it strikes me that what Unusual and other rental companies or industry do, they're already doing this. Yes. You know, bringing back trust from a show and sending it to another show is the start inherently of this. Circular. So inherently that's sort of what the company does anyway. Yeah. Um, I wonder if one of you quickly wants to, for those who haven't read the very fine article that appeared in this about this building, maybe one of you would just like to describe it quickly so everyone knows what we're talking about. Oh, the building? Yeah, so or in terms of what it's for and how it's made. Okay. Johnny? Johnny, you yeah. that. Um, so it's a 10,000 square foot office scheme. Um, it's the headquarters and uh, research facility for Unusual. And um, spread over two floors. Um, it replaces effectively a shed, dare I say, <laughs> uh, with no windows uh, and just top lit. So limited light, limited outlet. And the building has been located on a four acre site, which has all the comings and goings of unusual, which is a lot of lorries, unpacking, packing, um, a lot of activity. And what's lovely about the building now is it, it's reorientated itself on the opposite side of the site and now overlooks the business. And I think that's been a really important part of uh, the design and for everybody now using it, I hope, looking over there, um, I, I hope it's a really lovely way that you can actually see what it is you're doing uh, uh, rather than just uh, in front of a laptop or, or whatever your, your job might be. Um, so the building is 10,000 square foot of office with meeting rooms, boardroom, uh, kitchens, canteen, all, all those sorts of things that one would expect. It's probably slightly more cellular than a lot of offices are now. Um, there are distinct offices which, which house rigging or accounts or, or, or whatever it might be. Um, but I suppose fundamentally beyond what it is just as a building, um, the, the, it, it, it starts in this kind of circular uh, journey as being a timber framed superstructure that means that all the load bearing is done through um, CLT cross laminated timbers which have you know very good strength um, and then um, wherever possible we've used biogenic materials which are materials that come from nature that essentially store carbon so they act as what we term carbon sinks they they hold on to carbon um, and wherever we can and we could we've used we've used um, biogenic materials. There are a lot of materials in there that aren't. There is, there is steel in there where only steel would do, but all of that steel is reused. It's come from other buildings. Um, that's really important when we're talking about the circular economy because we're talking about reuse of materials. Uh, we're not talking about recycling. Recycling almost is the last resort because that requires energy to convert it to something else. Um, and um, and then the building is built up in layers so that, as you mentioned earlier, one day um, it will all be unbolted, uh, or most of it will be unbolted, and it will go on and have, a, a, have another life, long beyond us. And that, that's a really wonderful thought, that instead of it getting knocked down and demolished, it will be disassembled yes. and, and, uh, and reused. So, in a nutshell, that's, that's the building, but I mean, there's obviously a lot more to it. And the idea about that reuse as well is kind of foundational to what we as a business are all about because we're about the um, idea of temporary solutions, uh, temporary design solutions. So there's something quite simpatico about the fact that in 70, 80, maybe even 100 years, you know, the building has been designed for disassembly. Can anybody else hear what sounds like a dentist extraction going on? Everybody's okay with that? I probably shouldn't have used the first word there. We could say it's a building site. Let's forget about dentistry. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess my follow up question then is how, first thing on a very practical level, when you then approach people to build it, you need builders. And you say, they would, I imagine, go, this is how we build one of these buildings. We go, bup, 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 bup. When you guys show up and go, we want to do it like this, 
how many builders do you have to go through before you find the one that goes, okay, yeah, we'll buy into that. We'll work, we'll work to understand that. Well. <laughs> Without getting the lawyers involved. Obviously. Sure. I'm just checking who's in the room. Um, in many ways, I think we were quite lucky because I knew of a building, a construction management company that had actually built the Gloucester services, if anybody's ever been up or down the, the M5, uh, which are glue lamb, CLT, and also have biogenic materials embedded within the underside of the, uh, the ceiling. Uh, so we engaged them in conversation. They were very much of the ilk of, you know, between them about 75 years worth of experience in building, uh, some of them have come from uh, Buckingham Construction Group, from other long-standing established management construction companies. Get thumped. Um, but they were of the ilk of that sort of thing, thinking of, well, we just want to get it up as quickly as possible. We want to do it as cost effectively for you as possible. We are going to challenge you on some of these kind of weird ideas you've got about using something alternative to plasterboard that we've never used, but we'll give it a go. You're the client. If that's what you want, so be it. And there was a real dance. At times, a little bit of the dance, you would say, it was like a tango. There was a bit of conflict at times in our meetings uh, because uh, certainly one of Johnny's colleagues, as well as Johnny himself from Corsafina Wright, who were the architects, really had to push against the builders um, aspirations to just crack on with the job and to say no hang on a sec on principle there's an option to use this material I know that the lead time is slightly challenging I know that you've never necessarily worked with it before or if you have you've experienced these issues but can't we just can't we just explore it yeah I mean I think yeah a dance is a nice way to, to push it but it, it um, I think the, the, the building has come about on time, on budget, which in architecture is honestly pretty unusual. <laughs> and it's come about because there's been a great collaborative teamwork um, uh, relationship between the client, the design team, and, and, the, and the contractor. And, and we have had to push them. But also, I think in their defense, not that I need to defend them, but that that there's a real lack of supply in the supply chain of materials that can be used, um, that are reused, that have a warranty. Uh, you know, Tom and Anusia are in the fortunate position that you know they're not they're, they're self-funded, so they don't necessarily have to be quite so concerned about the warranty of a piece of. Well, we were about the steel work, but other we we reused all the raised access floors and. You know, we had I had pretty frank conversations with the contract saying, "Oh, we don't want to use the reused access floor." You know, be a pain in the what's it? And um, uh, well, uh, you, you know, they wanted to just buy something off the shelf, and they, we said, "No, we've got to find reuse," which they did. And and they, but then they were like, "Well, it's got no warranty," and it's like, "Well, realistically, what what's what going to go, go wrong? wrong with a raised <laughs> access floor?" Um, and and it. And, and then they laid it, and of course it was perfect, apart from a few marks here and there, which all gets covered anyway. And I said to them, you know, would you do that again? And of course they said, yes, we would. Uh, it was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. And, and I think that's an important part of this journey is that the changing of mindsets about how, how, uh, how we build, how we construct, how we look at the world around us and see it as a, an urban mine. Every building is an opportunity to take materials off it and reuse them, which is what we all, what we all did before the Industrial Revolution. It's only in our very fast-paced throwaway culture um, where we've lost that ability to look at a material and say, well, it's not quite the right shape, but we can make it work. And all of the steelwork in the building is not quite the right depth. So we employ something called loose-fit design, where we've allowed some tolerances so that we can use a steel that's a bit too big or a bit too small or a bit too wide. But it's fine, it works. It's just, it needs a, a level of robust interrogation and to really uh, 
to, to find a way to make it work. And once you get that mindset, yeah. you're flying. But I guess my question, because the thing that so I had a day there with Tom, which is, and, and you were there at the end, I think. But what was amazing is every time I asked Tom, the client, a question about a material, he could give me the full chapter and verse on it. Because you, you sort of, because you'd been so involved in the working it out. And I suspect most people who commission a building can't do that when I ask you about a chair. So I guess my question almost is how much more, how much of your life have you lost by having to do so much more research to then be able to lead everyone else to that? Well, the, I, I think it was more of an inspiration, really, the, the idea yeah. of, of the, some of the principles of the circular economy, especially when you think about the concept of biomimicry, imitating nature's genius, the fact that the planet, Mother Earth, is 3.8 billion years of research and development, and everything from butterfly wings to the chocolates of Dover, they've only actually been constructed or formed out of five um, ingredients, carbon, phosphate, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, something else, can't remember. <laughs> it's been a while <laughs> since I did the MBA. Um, but I thought, you know, from the get-go, the aspiration and speaking with KLH as well, was that we wanted what nature refers to, if you like, as a parsimonious palette, a really limited palette of resource. There was no reason to have lots of complex things. Of course, when you get into the electrical elements and uh, innovative designs on uh, the, the technology behind the lighting systems to ensure that we had rooms that were self-lighting based on movement, then you're, you're expanding that palette. But fundamentally, from the building construction point of view, we wanted to have this limited palette of resource that we, so we knew. So actually, it, well, I wasn't that clever, you know, <laughs> being able to know all of the, the materials. There are literally only many. about five of them okay. that uh, I could refer to. I don't know, maybe Boja. I, I would like to add that, uh, based on the question that you asked before, that we, we are talking about the builders, but also about the designers, the architects, and, and the client that we have. Uh, it's very good that we get uh, involved in this team because we were involved from the beginning, and you can also change the design based on knowledge uh, yeah. from previous experience. And that helps you to make a more sustainable um, building that when you are involved at the end, that, that happens as well in this industry. Um, so yeah, and having that power that the client provide to us of giving them our advice and always um, taking it in a right way and trying to implement that every time that is possible in the building. That is great and is the way to go. So is we have to change the mindset of the builders uh, that that is happening because after they have knowledge and they have experience building these type of buildings. Um, that happens, we have to change also some minds of some designers that it was not the case, but uh, based on my previous experience, uh, that happens sometimes. So it's very good that we had the opportunity to create this building and bring to all the audience the opportunity to see that this is possible. I mean, because I should just say, Tom then left me that afternoon because he was going to go, I can politely say, interrogate furniture suppliers about this. So this isn't just the building. This was then has extended to everything, I think, that goes in and furnishes and equips the building. Um, and I found that fascinating because I would almost put money that some of the people you were talking to probably didn't have the answers to your questions. Well, we we had, a, again, we were lucky with Corstaphine and Wright that they had an interior design team okay. that we decided that we wanted to employ with because they understood the principles that we were adhering to so stringently. So they only selected suppliers for the furniture and everything else, kitchen, that they knew were cradle to cradle certified. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the, uh, the term cradle to cradle certification. Yeah, most people are. Um, I think you've got a hardcore audience here. Yeah, it was great. On your side. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, so, so, the, so from a th furniture design point of view, yeah, we, we went down to London, we looked in the showrooms of various um, suppliers and manufacturers so that we could really ascertain that we were getting this the the cradle to cradle certification but also the aesthetic right which was very much the remit of cause to food right 
Yeah, I mean, I think interior design traditionally is quite a wasteful, if not the most wasteful part of design, architecture and construction. And I think the cradle to cradle certification is really important. But there's also lots of really simple things that you can do, like, for example, I don't know if these are carpet tiles, I think it is carpet, but a carpet tile, everybody's got them in all their offices. And they're normally glued down. So when you lift them up, you kind of rip the tile, the tile or you leave residue all over the floor. And da, da, da. So uh, unusual, they're not glued down, they're tacked down. So they just lift up. Those are cradle to cradle. So they then get broken back down to constituent parts and reused. The, uh, the subfloor, which is already reused, is damaged. That means that subfloor could go off again and be reused again. So I think there is the furniture, finishes, you know, they, they all have to be certified and, and they have to be robust and long term because a big part of being circular is making sure things last a long time. Um, so it's about you know investing in quality materials that are going to be that furniture will last the building. It won't it won't ever be changing. So it's there is all the kind of technical stuff to it, but there's just really simple things that you can do without even almost thinking about it. But you do have to think about it. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing I took away was it, this has worked because everyone has thought about it and then been prepared to stick to the argument in the critical moments. Except, and I don't mean except in a bad way, but it also there were some materials where you were, I mean, the, the plasterboard, breathe plaster, I think it's called. Breathe board, yeah. So Tom had discovered, so plasterboard is like the enemy, is my understanding of it, in terms of circularity, because it's full of miserable materials that can't turn into anything else that buildings are built of it because all the builders know it and it's quick and easy and they all know the routine. Um, breatheboard is a, you can tell me what it's made of in a second, but a breathable, I think, recyclable, re compost, whatever, material that it turned out didn't quite exist in a big enough quantity yet, I think was the end story. So maybe just talk about that material specifically. Well, um, so, but yes, you're right, plasterboard, which is gypsum, is responsible for huge amounts of uh, construction waste globally and never breaks down, can never be reused. Um, I'd just like to add as well that from a circular economy point of view, if you're doing the circular economy properly, like Johnny said earlier, you don't include recycling. Recycling is not yes, the sorry. circular economy because of the embodied energy and extracted energy requirements to facilitate that recycling. So it has to be either designed for durability, designed for disassembly and reuse fundamentally, but ideally a parsimonious palette. Breatherboard had all of that because breatherboard is a composite of, I think, like mushrooms and hay and <laughs> hemp and other, other composite values that was designed by a guy called Tom Robinson, who set up a company called Adaptabate. He won the Imperial College Award for Innovation in 2013. So it's been a long time coming, this innovation, and he'd gone through all sorts of phases with the prototype. And we were at the stage where we were, com I was confident that they, <laughs> after this time, they had it ready. ready and set. It's 25% lighter than a standard piece of plasterboard, same size. It can, it can last just as long as plasterboard. At the end of its life, it can literally be broken down and used as, as fertilizer or as, as used as food for, for farming, for soil. It's very regenerative. And there's some suggestion that it almost absorbs a bit of CO2, so, so CO2 sequestering capacity, okay. but they're not allowed to advertise that. So we said, yes, we'd go ahead with it. There was an issue with lead time. So we decided just to use our boardroom, our breather boardroom as the, uh, <laughs> the pilot, as the prototype space. Um, we stuck them all up. And then the challenges ensued, which was that the actual breathability of the board was so brilliant that when it was painted, when it was skimmed, the skim after drying just started to crack and crumble. Okay. Now, I would have been happy with it looking like it was, you know, a, I don't know, a, a, a Stephen King horror movie on the walls with this sort of plaster falling and things. But, you know, from an aesthetic point of view, <laughs> all of the stakeholders were like, I mean, internally, uh, my team are unusual. They're like, we, we can't do this. This looks crap. Okay. You know? So, what are we going to do instead? So, unfortunately, we had to take it down. It was a it was a really good process to go through with that activate. 
okay. they were ben they were very grateful for us. I still have to speak to their CEO about a small share option on the basis that we were the pilot. Okay. Uh, the, you know, joking. But they're Not. interesting as well because they, in my mind, they also have a breathable plaster. That's right. But which won't plaster. work with the the breather board, board. That, right? They, not. Um, no, well, what we did, we ended up using the breather plaster, so that okay. was fine. So we put, we ended up, unfortunately, we trialed it, it didn't work, we had to go with conventional plaster board. But uh, uh, Borja, you'll know more, won't you, about the actual percentage of embedded CO2 in the plaster board. For, for the whole build, it was pretty small, wasn't it? Yeah, it was pretty small. Uh, I don't remember the number, uh, I think it was less than 1%, but it yeah. was, yeah, less than 1% for sure. Yeah. So, so as a result, putting breather plaster on, and it does look beautiful. It does feel, I mean, I've got some guys from Unusual, the, the, the atmosphere, the ambience in that space, and the smell slightly of mushrooms or <laughs> something woodlandy. Hippie plaster. It, yeah, it kind of just makes you feel like, yeah, this is, this is, there's something regenerative going on. Okay. So, uh, I think in talking to people there is a fear that when you either do something in a different way or you do something using unconventional materials the other risk you have from a purely practical point of view is it costs more money or it takes much longer but it feels to me like you've happened pretty much on a schedule it will take is that true mm -hmm. well i mean maybe just describe the timeline for everybody well we've got a fun video don't worry it won't be 12 months but we can maybe talk about the timeline yeah. running through the do video. It. I don't know what we're on timing-wise. Like, I think we have five minutes and then we'll do ten minutes of questions. Okay, so should we do the timeline and we can talk about it? Oh, look, here we are. Here's the, some information about breather board. Um, yeah, car groundbreaking car. It is carbon sequestering alternative. We're the first company globally. Improved thermal efficiency. Still the same way as plaster board, but lighter. Yeah. And actually, these are just some nice, but you probably can't see them. But, yeah. I mean, just to touch on here, the other thing that sort of was implied but not mentioned, but the other part of making it as efficient to build as possible is the design, because everything is designed to work to the width of the materials. So like yes. the cladding is in the width of the material comes in, as I understand. Yes, I mean, it's, it's built to a module, so that um, it's on a five meter grid, so that, <coughs> yeah, it, it sort of, maximizes the use of the materials um, it maximizes the adaptability of the spaces so that by having a regular grid you can easily move things around build new partitions take partitions out okay. um, so there is a yeah there's an efficiency in how in how that's been achieved um, yeah you, sorry producing that waste is super important if we have in mind that it's a 17 percent of waste uh, so if you take the whole mass of a building usually in the industry 13 percent of that mass is gone for waste if you can reduce that waste as we did using this type of materials and being involved from the design on thinking how to make it better um, it's really useful to also reduce the carbon that is coming from the building show us a video Tom. show us a video okay. Well, these are just some images of the interior design, actually. That, for examples, all of these, all of these materials, all of these um, items of furniture are cradle to cradle certified. We didn't want to use anybody but the companies that were able to assure us of that. Um, this is a lot of nice data for anybody that enjoys data. Because you were monitoring all of this. We I were. Think. We're so KLH. Yeah. Were, we that, that was the that was the that was the agreement. We really wanted it from the get-go. We wanted their guidance, their advice. We wanted assessments in it. Those assessments really helped us in meetings when we were deciding between rock wall panel, which is a type of volcanic composite for the outside of the building, versus a coir, because a coir comes all the way from New Zealand. So how's that sustainable? You know, but actually, when you look at the materiality and the CO2 embedded emissions within those particular materials, in contrast to one another, a coir wins out, hands down. Yeah. Um, and also the rock wall panel makes it look, it would have made it look like a McDonald's. <laughs> so we didn't want to do that. The coir wood is beautiful. Yeah. So in, in all, I mean, anybody that wants a copy of these, you please speak to me. We're very happy to share, disseminate the information. Um, 
Okay, so I, hopefully if I press it again, it will play. We also wanted to regenerate the, the landscape around, so we, we planted, I think, up to 14 trees, um, native uh, trees that will also change with the seasons. So whilst they flourish in the summertime, the leaves will fall in the winter and we'll get a view back onto the site. You can see as we span round on the four acre point, because my, the, the founder of the business, my, my father, his ashes are actually planted under the tree there. So there's a lovely sort of concept that he's got our back still. Uh, and the roof is solar, which yep. you can see. Yes, it's, the energy that um, the building consumes is from eight minutes old sunlight and also air source. So it's pretty efficient. And I think we're, I think we're, I don't know actually, we are operationally. We haven't done the, we haven't, we've got somebody here that's going to help us with that. <laughs> the data on that. Yeah, and you can see, well, you can see across the whole site, the, the truss warehouse there, that's got a 100 kilowatt system on, uh, 392 solar panels, which is a 100 kilowatt solar system. Yes, it looks a bit more finished than yes, when I was there. Yes, it does, yeah. All of the, um, all of the uh, slabs and the stones on the outside of the building, they were all reclaimed, and it's something that we've all been familiar with for years and years and years. You can go to reclaim yards and get these things. But what was lovely was round the very front we managed to reclaim cobbles from Northampton Market that had been laid in the early 1800s. And it just so happened that one of the team on the uh, building construction team had heard that they were, well, everybody knew that there was this demolishment going on and this, um, re this, this renovation to the site. And it just seemed such a shame. So we were delighted we were able to get hold of them. You can see the slightly darker cobbles he was the, the, the builder, I have to say that again, the builders, who was the site manager? Um, uh, John. John. John Barker. Had absolutely bought into this. And he was so excited about the fact that they'd heard of this and gone and got it. And so excited about it. I mean, the breather board he was quite excited about, which surprised me for somebody who felt a bit like an old school, a little bit builder. And that was, so I think what was also amazing was the way you sort of got everybody to buy into this. Just before we do some questions, so when did you start on site? This is like my grand designs moment. Yeah. When did you start on site? <laughs> and when was it finished? July. Yes. July 2023. July okay. 2023. So it's one year. We moved in June uh, the 16th. 11 months? Yeah. Okay. Pretty good yeah. going. Yeah. So 11 months. Okay. And everybody loves it, I believe. They do. What was really lovely was somebody from our accounts department said to me, it's great. I feel like I've got a new job and I didn't even need to interview, which I thought was quite nice. That was Gail who said that. Uh, who has questions? Even people from Unusual should be allowed to ask questions at this point, I think, but anybody else? Do we have a, there's a microphone coming because otherwise they can't hear you. So wait for the microphone. I know, it's just a gentleman here. Uh, that sounds weird. <laughs> um, probably the usual question, but what do you think the overall extra cost was for going down the sustainable route if you hadn't gone down? I think it was the standard um, cost associated with square foot, is it? Yeah. It's about 350. Yeah. 350 pounds per square foot, this probably about 385 to 390 square foot. But the really important consideration here again, this is where we need our, our leaders at political level to uh, start really reviewing subsidies, is the idea of true cost. The idea that what we really wanted to explore was the true cost of our footprint, which isn't done anywhere really. Um, so the true cost considers the social and the environmental impact of the decisions that you make in construction or in business in general. What, what is the impact? There's too many hidden externalities with economic factors. And we wanted to be as transparent as we could so that we could make that assessment. So for us, the financial cost, albeit 
slightly greater, you know, maybe 40 pound square foot greater, which is considerable when you times that all up, was nothing compared to the true cost. And if you compared true cost with our building to a conventional building, I think people would be appalled you know, at the damage we're doing. We know this. I mean, I wonder also as a part of that, because the steel, as we talked about, is um, reused. But the pro but, and so you feel maybe that should be a saving because it exists. But then talk about, the, you told me about having to get it recertified and retested. And so you end up with additional costs for doing the right thing. Effectively. Yeah, which was really frustrating because really, there, again, there should be legislation here. There should be taxation, carbon taxation, where... When, you're, when you are trying to do the right thing, because we all recognize that we are living in a climate emergency, then th th there needs to be just different parameters. We shouldn't be penalized. But the guys, actually, we managed to beat them down on the price a little bit. <laughs> it was, uh, I won't mention their name, but they were, a, they were a steel manufacturing and production company. And they just put a ridiculous price tag on the, the requirement to tensile strength test secondary use of steel, which was absurd. And they've now recognized the value in reducing that and being able to tout that they're circular. Okay. But I think that will change as the, as the supply chain improves. Because at the moment, there are hardly any certifiable steel suppliers. Okay. As we do it more, and we are doing it a lot now, it's one of the most um, reusable building materials around. That price will start to come down. I mean, I, can I just throw my question? So, Tom, you've built, I mean, you've built your building and I don't think you're immediately building another one. Johnny, you will go on to the next building and the next building. So yeah. what are you taking from this? And are you taking it to buildings or are you trying to persuade other clients to buy into this? Um, well, I mean, we've been on a massive journey. So, you know, we had, a, we had an interest uh, and an understanding of what it is to be circular, but nothing like the expertise we now have and the innovation we've had to go through as a company um, to to be able to design a building like this. So, you know, we have a huge opportunity now and responsibility to start to spread that expertise and that innovation into all of the, the projects we're doing. Buy up or buy in, it can be challenging. You know, there are still plenty of clients out there who will just the only thing they will think about is, is getting in and out for as little as possible. Um, but, but that's changing massively. Uh, I, you know, we're talking to quite a few of the London estates at the moment. We have a, you know, a stewardship role in their, um, in their, in their estates, and, and therefore they have that longer term investment, and they therefore can perhaps justify that investment more easily um, as companies ESG policies become more and more important. The buildings they operate in become much more uh, important at how sustainable they are. So it's it's all beginning to change. And, and you know, I'll I'll talk to anybody for hours about what we've achieved there because I, I think it's it's very unusual. 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 There there are there's quite a lot of circular. Uh, designed buildings in London at the moment, but they're nearly always the reuse of an existing building because their embodied carbon is already there. Designing new build circular is it's not unheard of, but it's really, really in its infancy and it's very unusual and it's really challenging. Are there any more questions before we run out of time? Nick, front. Hi. Um when you build a new building, normally they start by digging holes in the ground and filling that with concrete, which presumably is going to stay there forever, unless someone goes to the effort of digging it out. Yeah. Then it goes into it. How did you get around that from a circularity point? Uh, well, the, the, the slab is concrete, and the foundations are concrete. Um, with, with a building like this, there's always a balance of what you can do, what is technically possible, and what is economically possible. And uh, Northamptonshire has a lot of radon, uh, which means that we have to put extra measures in place to stop that radon filtering up through the building. 
Um, and, and there was quite a lot of groundwater. So we had to have, in the end, we had to have concrete. There are enormous steps being made in concrete, in, in the ability to reuse concrete. And there's a lot in the press about it at the moment. And I suspect by the time this building does need to be reused, concrete will, will be widely um, reused. But it's, it, we all kind of had to close our eyes a bit when Ready Mix turned up and pulled the concrete in. But it is low carbon concrete and we've saved 25-ish tonnes, I think, of carbon yeah. that way. Yeah, we've used very lightweight uh, and as little reinforcement in that slab as possible, which is down to the engineers. So, albeit it's a concrete slab, um, it's the best concrete slab we could we could we could use. The best worst. Yes, the best worst case. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was depressing to have to use it. I, I felt very upset about the fact that there weren't alternative options out there. But for all of the reasons that Johnny's outlined, there really weren't there really weren't any options. So we were very transparent about that as well, saying, okay, well, at least we could go for low carbon concrete, but there's something about CO two emissions as a result of that. But I think just on the figures, uh, a standard building, office building, has about 900 kilograms of CO2 um, embodied carbon per square metre. This building has about 360. So my, the target set by the Royal Institute of British Architects is 500. By 2030, we're, we're actually attempting to get to 350. So we're nearly achieving 2030 target. So al albeit there's concrete, the embodied carbon is still very, very low compared to, and operationally, it's negative. So yeah. it generates it's net positive, yeah. which is great. Yeah. I would like also to add uh, to here to this uh, conversation that we are talking about circularity, but the main thing at the beginning is reduce the material that you are using. If you are not using any material, finally the carbon, you are not emitting any carbon. And if you are reducing the quantity of material, you are reducing carbon. Doesn't matter if it's low carbon or it's high carbon, you are reducing that amount of carbon. And also being involved in the design help us to uh, challenge the architect in this, in this uh, time or the structural engineers to try to reduce the amount of concrete as much as possible. And after that is when you have to look for a low carbon option for the concrete that you have to use because of all of the characteristics of the ground that yeah, John, yes, it's great. Okay, maybe one more quick the microphone in hand, go. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, super interesting, and I can't wait to visit, it looks beautiful. Um, I was just wondering, I'm really interested in how you've used the building to reduce the carbon intensity of the operations that go on within it. So I saw you had the solar panels, I think you mentioned air source heat pump potentially, and the smart lighting. Do you think there's anything else that you could do, like down the line, that could help reduce the intensity of what you're doing in the building? We designed the windows, didn't we, on the basis that we wanted to reduce the heat light element. So we had a fantastic um, M&E consultant to begin with who did a very thorough assessment. So that was the dance as well between passive house accreditation and circularity principles. And actually I think the passive house, um, which is a great accreditation, still needs consideration because basically you're creating a sealed box. We have a pretty sealed box. I think we were just just off passive house accreditation, but it's they're triple glazed windows, and I mean you can speak to members of the team who are behind you about the ambience in the building. It's the, the medium temperature. The the inspiration was always to look at a termite mound and say, wow, a termite mound, a 150 million year old structure. You know how do, how is it that it's designed by termites? to always be median average somewhere between 16 and 22 degrees inside with fluctuations outside of up to 50 degrees down to minus 12 at night. It doesn't look like a turn of mind. But the principle is the same, this idea of building for that level of economic ambient energy use. Okay, I think probably we run out of time then. Um, so on behalf of all of you, I'm going to say thank you to these wonderful people for the the wonderful building but also this wonderful inspiration I hope to the rest of us because I go away wanting to build better and I hope the rest of you do too so let's do it in an old-fashioned way thank you very much